from Deuteronomy 6. And it is, if you follow along. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord, your God, directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land of in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig. And vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of other people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and will anger and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to test as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of your Lord, your God, and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you, and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord has said. In the future, when your son asks, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws that our Lord, our God, has commanded? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord has brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees. And to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all of the law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Good morning. How is everybody? Good? Thank you for being here today. Now I'll follow up to John. John. I'll speak. Thank you guys for supporting me so much. It's overwhelming. I definitely see God's call. I hope you guys do. Most of you do. And I thank you for your support in every aspect that I could ever dream, dream of, and especially in your prayers. And let's start this morning with prayer. Father, I thank you so much for being able to be here, Lord, to be a part of this church to be a part of this family. And Father, I pray that you use each and every one of us, Father, that we are open, broken vessels so that your light may shine through us, so that we may bring glory and honor to you, our Creator and to our Lord. And Father, that we may also bring others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Help us to not be caught up in the things of this world, but be caught up in things that matter for all eternity, dear Lord. And we just thank you and praise you. Pray your blessings upon the word today and I just pray that you open up our hearts and that we not only hear the things that you would have us to hear, but definitely apply them to our lives as well. And we thank you and praise you for us in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So if you notice, the movies are are kind of based on courage and what it takes to be a light in this world, a father that you would need to be in this world and stuff. It's not easy. It's not an easy job. No one ever said it would be. And so many parents want to give up because it is too hard. So they just let their kids do whatever they want. But that's definitely not what God's idea of family is. And we're going to look at that some today. We're going to stay on that topic. 
God's design for the family. And for the last couple of weeks, we've talked about family. But it doesn't do any good to say you should live like a family if you don't know how a family should live. So today we're going to look at that. And that means not only our immediate families, but our church family, and then our families as being children of God. We're supposed to be the building blocks. We talked about that some last week to this world rather than a stumbling block. That is the opposite of being a building block. We want to build up the name of the church. We want to build up love. We want to build up the image of Jesus Christ. Not be a stumbling block to others where they say, well, I would have been a Christian if I didn't know a Christian. And that's such a terrible thing to hear. It was so important that Jesus came to this earth. He gave up everything He had to live and die for us, to reconcile us into the family of God. And then when He left, He said, I've got to leave so that the Spirit can come and empower you, comfort you, and teach you. So He left so that the Spirit could live inside of us, teaching us how. But the Spirit's not going to affect us, no matter how much we say, lead a Spirit, if we're not broken, if we don't allow the Spirit to do that. We need to study God's Word. We need to spend our time in prayer, seeking out His will. And that's what we're going to do a little bit today. We're going to see what families are supposed to be like by a biblical definition, but not by the definition of this world. I challenge you, go look up family. Look at the definition. You'll get such a broad spectrum of what family means today that it's just there is no uniform uh, thing. There is a sense of belongingness that you'll read, but it can be in any social group. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with a mother and a father and siblings, which the Bible's based on. So why do you think today's culture is in such a crisis We don't know what God wants. We don't know what God intended, even in the basic concepts of marriage and family. The reason for this crisis is we've departed from it. We, as mothers and fathers, as family members, we haven't lived an example of the life that we should live. So when our kids go away, they don't want to be like the families they've seen. They don't want to be around a mom and dad that's fussing, a mom and dad that gets divorced, a mom and dad that on Sunday says... I love Jesus, but then they curse out their um, spouse through the week. What an inconsistent pattern that we set for them. And we're all guilty somewhat, some worse than others. So we need to take that and put it at the cross. Jesus will take it. He'll take that burden from us. And if we're broken, His Spirit can fill us, teach us, use us to be obedient children. So how can you expect your children to know unless you teach them and show them? And if we look at some of the Old Testament families... That's what they did. They taught their children to fear God. Yeah, they worked. They had to eat just the same. Maybe they didn't have as many toys to live for. Maybe it wasn't so important that he who dies with the most toys wins. But they had to provide for their family. They had to work. They hunt and fish, guys. They even had more of abundance of it. So it's not that they didn't have the same things. They understood the importance of teaching their children to grow up to be godly men and women. If we're not teaching them by word and by example, then how are they to know? We pick and choose the commandments that we should follow. Shame on us. We say, yes, I understand thou shalt not steal, but I don't understand that thou shalt not gossip. And both are in here. Maybe not as ten commandments, but they're both in here. So we wonder why our children are struggling today. Well, let's look at the Word of God and see what He has to say. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I looked at the message to see what it would say, because sometimes it always gives a refreshing approach to it. I'll use that as a term. It says, every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, Showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's ways, not the world's way. Through the Word, we are put together and shaped for the task God has for us. So how can you expect to teach your children? How can you expect to live a godly life if you're not diligently spending time in His Word, seeking God? I hear so many times people say, boy, I just wish I knew what the Spirit had in store for me. I don't really want to serve here in this capacity because I don't know if it's where the Spirit wants me to serve. Well, you know what? Spirit wants you to serve wherever. It's not so much that you know that you're supposed to do this particular thing. 
you're supposed to be serving daily. And He might lead you in a certain direction. But you need to be obedient in serving first. And if you are going to discover Him, you need to spend time in the Bible searching His Word. That's where you're going to find it revealed to you. Don't be waiting for the burning bush to tell you what to do. Seek God's Word. Spend time in prayer. And it'll be pretty, pretty obvious. If we're going to live the way God intended, we've got to be grounded in the Scriptures. The Bible clearly teaches what marriage is. Clearly teaches what a family is. Marriage is a covenant, which is a pledge, a promise, a guarantee, or a contract between one man and one woman. Not between different individuals, but one man and one woman. It's something that's meant to be a lifetime. Not something that's meant to be thrown away when I'm not getting out of the marriage what I wanted to get out of it. We've read 1 Corinthians 13 and we understand what love is, but do we put that into play? That it is patient and kind, long-suffering, it doesn't hold grudges. Or do we hold grudges as soon as it's not the way that we like it to be? We're self-centered people. We are. We're sinful. And only by the grace of God can we ever obtain salvation. But we can because Jesus Christ lived a perfect life and died for us. We don't have to be perfect. But we need to be focused on the Word of God so that we can try to live as holy a life as possible. To be a building block rather than a stumbling block. So let's look at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 30, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be your food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. Well, the world teaches you that we evolved, that we're just top of the food chain. God's Word says it quite differently. He created everything that He created so that we could enjoy it. He created the moon and the stars, billions and billions of stars, and billions and billions of galaxies, so that we could look up on a starry night and the heavens could declare the glory of God. He put us right in a certain place in the universe where we could see that. We're not in parts of the universe where you can't even see because of the cosmic things that are going on. But He put us in a place where we could see the heavens declare the glory of God. He created a wonderful earth for us, animals to enjoy, plants to enjoy, food to provide for us. Then He placed us in it. We were not an afterthought. We did not evolve. We were put on this earth to enjoy this earth and to subdue this earth. One man and one woman building relationships so that we could understand the relationship that that God wants with us. If we live outside of those designs, we're going outside of the way He designed it and we're bringing corruption to His creation. And yes, we live in a sinful, fallen world. We can't help that. But we can live godly lives. If you'll notice, it says He blessed them told them to be fruitful and multiply. We're supposed to raise our children, not just have children and then let them go do whatever they want because it's easier that way than to say no and to give them discipline. They're going to imitate our behavior. Sometimes you may have a father that was an alcoholic. Sometimes you may say, I don't want to do that. And you may not do that behavior because of what you've seen. But how much better would it be that I don't drink alcohol as a child because my parent taught me not to drink alcohol in excess. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with alcohol. And notice I said in excess. Being a drunkard, there is something wrong with. And if my parent teaches me that I shouldn't be that way, then how honorable is that for the Father? And the Word of God goes on to say that God will bless that type of behavior. It's God's design that that people are married and there is a family. It's not up for debate. It's not up to say, well, what is a family? Is this type of family scenario okay? Or this type of family scenario okay? And I know that many people broke, grow up in broken homes. And it's a shame. And they, as a child, you can't do anything about it. 
But us as parents could have done something about it before it got to that point. We could have cared more about our children. We could have cared more about our spouse. We could have cared more about our relationship with God and what it looks like to others. If we live outside of God's parameters, instead of bringing grace and bringing honor to God, we bring dishonor to God. We must live as God designed to be those building blocks. It's God's way or no way. That's the right way. It's not up for debate. Genesis 1.31, if we read on, says this, God saw all that He made, and it was very good. It was perfect. And there was evening, and there was morning, and there was a sixth day. God doesn't make mistakes. He didn't mis- to make mistakes in any one of you when, when He created and put the breath of life into you. He didn't make mistakes when He ordained and set up the parameters for marriage and for family. It's not up for debate. Many theologians through history have said that families are the building blocks of society. Well, the Bible reconfirms that, doesn't it? It makes all the difference in the world if we can't start at home and manage our own families. How in the world is this world going to be? Let's keep reading on in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 20 says this, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now two key things stick out to me there. It's not good for man to be alone. That means that he needs to have a relationship. And what did God create for a relationship? Well, let's read on and see. So so the Lord, in verse 21 and 22, So the Lord God caused the man to fall asleep into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought him to her to him. God didn't make a dog. That's man's best friend, right? He didn't make another man to go fishing and hunting with be his buddy. He made a woman. It was totally different than a man. We don't understand or comprehend whatsoever, but that's what he made. And it's supposed to teach us. And we're supposed to love our spouse as ourselves. I heard a joke once, and i got to tell you it, because it puts some of it into perspective. Now take, it's only a joke. This isn't from God. But Adam was sitting there one day, and God said, you know, it's not good to be alone. Adam's like, you're right, it's not good to be alone. And he said, well, i tell you what I'm going to do. God said this. He said, I am going to make you the perfect companion. One that will cook for you, she'll clean your home, she'll do whatever you tell her, she'll flip the TV channels, now you know it's a joke, whenever you ask her to flip the TV channels, we won't even need remote control TV because we'll have her. What do you think, Adam? He said, that sounds great. He says, well, what would you do for that, Adam? Would you give an arm and a leg? He said, what do I get for a rib? And the rest is history. That's not true, okay? But we can understand that perspective. Relationships are very important to God. And everything that God created was perfect. Perfect in every way. So we can learn something from reading God's Word. We can learn how relationships are supposed to be. We can learn how um, families are supposed to be. God created one man, one woman, told them to multiply and fill the earth. And that gives them a responsibility of taking care of this earth. So many people say that we should be responsible, we should be green, you know, everything else. But they don't want to put the other part in and say that we should be married, that we should raise a family, that we should teach our children godly parameters. Everybody agrees we should keep the earth up, but then that's where we depart from the truth. God loved us and created everything that He created for us to enjoy. We read on in Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, we read this. The man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Notice Adam's response here. He broke out in song, is what he did. 
He was so excited for what God had done for him. Now, you go back and ask him five years down the road, he might not be that way quite as much, right? But when God created woman, he said, This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. He was so excited because he knew that God was perfect. God doesn't make mistakes. God created for man a woman to be a lifelong companion and to raise children from that relationship. Do you think of your wife that way, men? You should. You should think what a blessing from God that your spouse is. And it works the same way, ladies. You should think the same thing. So whenever you're thinking differently, stop. Take it to God right there. And thank Him for the blessings that He has given you and your spouse. Everything that God made was perfect. Any distortion of this biblical design of marriage or family is against God's design. Sin is against God's design. It's disobedience. And when we go away from His plan, that's what we're doing is we're sinning against a righteous and holy God. And we deserve judgment for that, don't we? And that's what happened if we read on. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now what's important here is the devil hasn't changed. He's the same way now as he was then. He wants to destroy those relationships. What a better way than to start with destroying your marriage, your family. Because if you can't have those, you can't have the building blocks. So how will you ever know? He'll destroy society. And how will you ever know the loving relationship that God intended between us and the Father if we let Satan deceive us? He wants us to question God's authority, His design, His definitions, and His commands. Let's read on. Genesis 3, 6, and 7. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. If you notice in the passage we just read in the earlier verses, it says they were naked and not ashamed. Now it says they were naked and they were, they were shame, um, brought shame upon them. Relationships changed. The relationship between man and woman was perfect. There was no sin. There was no shame. But because of disobedience to God, not following His plan, not following His rules, we brought shame and and disgrace into our relationship, into our marriage, into our home. Relationships were defiled as a result of sin. Satan wants to destroy you. Don't forget that. Any way but God's way is wrong and is a rebellion. Adam and Eve's relationship was forever changed, and so is our relationships. If we read on in verse 9, But the Lord God called to man and said, Where are you? God knew what happened. He didn't have to call out to Adam to see what was going on. But think about this just a minute. You were in a perfect, loving relationship with God. And then He had to cry out and say, Where are you? What a devastating thing to hear. That means that Adam's relationship was severed with God. didn't mean that God didn't know where he was. It meant that, Adam, you are lost now. You are separated from the love that I tried to give you. I don't know how Adam related to that, but what a devastating thing for God to call out to you and say, where he was right there with you all the time, where are you? I can't imagine that. Genesis chapter 3 verse 23 says this, As a result, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground for which he had been taken. When we sin against a righteous and holy God, he has to punish us. But thank goodness that he loves us so much that he sent Jesus to take that punishment away from us. When Jacob turned 18, he'll get mad when he hears this because he doesn't like when I use him as examples. But when he turned 18, I had given him an ultimatum time and time again. I said, your behavior needs to be modified. And that's exactly what Lowell said when he preached about family. 
He said training is called behavior is is behavior modification. You're training up their child so they won't behave in a way that is sinful and inconsistent to God's plan. If we don't train them, if they don't think it's worth it, what will happen? They will turn from God's plan. Jacob, I trained him up, and on his 18th birthday, he did something that got him kicked out of my house. That relates so much to the passage there. That was the hardest, one of the hardest for sure, things that I ever did was say, Son, you have disobeyed and disobeyed, and now it's time you have to face the consequences. It didn't last too long because he said he was going to amend his ways and come back and everything. I don't know how he felt about it. I don't know how Adam felt about it. But I know how I felt about it. And the reason I'm saying that is look what we did to God. Every time that we disobey and we say that my needs are more important than your needs, God, what are we saying to God? How does God feel? And he does have feelings. I know that day was a terrible, terrible day to me. It was such a loss. Not that my son disobeyed so much, but that our relationship was severed and I had to banish him from my house. But we can restore relationships, can't we? We can take those things to the altar and say, God, please forgive me. Because of what Jesus did, He has bridged the gap and now I can take the Father's hand through Him. We can restore those relationships. We're still God's children, aren't we? Hallelujah. And God's plan for His people are perfect, for family is perfect. Let's read on in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, and we'll see how quickly families can deteriorate. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Can't you imagine your teenager when you ask him something like that? No offense, guys. But that's what you get so much is you get, What? Why are you asking me? Well, if God asked him, that means that God did intend for him to know where his brother was. He intended family relationships. He should have known and cared where his brother was because his brother was his brother, his family. So God had every right in asking him that. And if you go back just a couple verses, God warned him. Genesis chapter 4, 6, and 7. It says, And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. What did we say earlier about Satan? That's his job. That's what he does. He wants to destroy relationships. And if you don't watch it, sin is crouching at your door. If you've ever watched any of the Discovery channels or anything, watched animals, the predator is crouched waiting for that prey so that he can take that prey and rip the life out of it. He's not going to play with it. He's not going to take the deer and when he's through playing with it, say, okay, go on your way now. He's going to destroy the deer and devour it. And that's what the devil and sin do. God established marriage and families. He doesn't want us to go with what's popular or what's acceptable. He wants us to go by His Word and His Word only. We read Deuteronomy this morning, and that passage that started out says, Love the Lord your God. And I want to go through it again and just kind of highlight some. Starting in verse 1, it says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you. Not ideas, not suggestions, but laws and commands. To observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, that you... And not only you, but your children, and what else? Their children after them may fear the Lord your God. How long? As long as you live. By keeping some of my commandments? No, all of His decrees and commands that I give you. And why? God gives a promise after that. That's what's so cool. He doesn't have to give the promise. He could just tell us, here's what we should do and not do. But He gives a promise so that you may enjoy long life. We are to love God, not act like it, not come to church or or behave a certain way because our parents want us to or because of any other reason. We're supposed to love God wholeheartedly, to truly love Him. And only God knows our heart and our intent. We are called to live obedient, holy lives and to teach and train our children. We can't stop there so that they will be saved, so that they will pass it on to their children. 
and so that they may have a long, prosperous life. Jesus knew it. Do you understand it? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 36 through 38, when He summed, it, summed up the greatest commandment. So, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know how many times you've read through the Ten Commandments, but they're all based on relationships. They're first based on relationship with God and then relationship with others. God wants us to be in godly relationships, and it has to start in our marriage. It has to go into our homes. If it doesn't, how can we teach the world? How can we make a difference? And the reason that I'm stressing so much on families right now is because we're not going to be effective church if we don't learn to love our spouse, our families, and then our church body. We'll never be effective. We can go spinning our wheels all we want to. We can come to church each day, but if we're going to be the church, we're going to have to learn to love like families are intended to love. Let's finish reading Deuteronomy. Verse 3, it says, Hear, O Israel, be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. It says again, hear. So he's telling them again, listen up, guys. O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Seems like we just heard that. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Not just teach them, but keep on. Talk about them. When? When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So that means all the time. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kind of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery." Well, now he's talking about the Israelites here and what all he did for them, right? He did so much for you. You live in a land where you're free. Free to pursue the career you want to pursue. Free to have marriages. To pick out the spouse you want to pick. To have families. To thrive. To pursue the American dream. And how do you have that except not by the grace of God? You couldn't control where you were born. You can't control what you do to provide for them. Sure, you can go out and work hard. But only by the grace of God do you have oxygen. Only by the grace of God do you have your physical abilities. He provides everything that you have. So this is not just relevant to the Israelites. It's relevant to all of us. And don't let us forget that. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God. Serve Him only. And take your oaths in His name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. Don't give in to what's popular. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and His anger will burn against you, and He will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not test your Lord, your God, as you did at Messiah. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and stipulations and decrees He has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you and may go and you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised, an oath to your forefathers, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said, in the future when your son asks, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him. Take the time. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders great and terrible upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised an oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive. And if we are careful to obey all of the law before the Lord our God, as he commanded 
That will be our righteousness. The passage is pretty clear. Maybe it helps when I highlight a little bit. Although you did a great job, David. Thank you. But it's clear. We're supposed to teach our families. We're supposed to live godly lives. When they ask, tell them. When they don't ask, tell them anyway. Because it matters. Family life is the building blocks of society. It will either be a living building block or a stumbling block. And what do you expect if you only put in half-hearted effort? Come on, guys, be serious. If you put in half-hearted effort, what do you expect for half-hearted results? Do you want to live in a house that's built that way? Or do you want to focus all that you have on God? Genesis 26, 1 through 5 says this, Now there was a famine in the land besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerir. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. God wants the best for you. For you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Why? Listen up. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my commandments, my requirements, my decrees, and my laws. Exodus twelve twenty three through 27 says this, When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, He will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And He will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Obey these destructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as He promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean, then tell them. Guys, especially I call out to you, and that's why I'm going to play Courageous Friday and stuff. Men, it starts with you. You're the head of your household. You can either half-heartedly serve God, or you can serve Him with all of your heart. You can train up your children to correct their behavior, and to instruct them in ways and righteousness, or you can let them go down a path of destruction. It's up to you. God's Word is clear. These weren't my words, not anything that I wanted to say, but what God wanted to speak to us so that we can build loving relationships. So I ask you today, guys, if you need to clear out anything out of your closets, if you're half-heartedly serving Him, then stop that today. Give it to God and start serving Him with your whole heart. Your wives will follow. Your marriage will be glorified. Your children will come up in a godly home and you'll see the fruit in their lives as a result. You may not see it exactly when you want it. You have to be obedient. That's why they call it faith. And you can't put God in a box and expect Him just to go by what you want. But if you live righteous and holy lives and teach your children to live righteous and holy lives... God does promise you that He will take care and bless your families. If you think society is going downhill today, then we've turned away from God as the reason. No other reason. So I challenge you guys today to set yourselves right. Let's make our families what they ought to be. Let's make this church what it ought to be. And make a mighty impact and bring glory to God and honor that He so much deserves. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Thank you for your guidance. Your words are clear, and you do want to have a relationship. You don't hide yourself from us, and you know that we can't ever reach you. So you love us enough to come to us. Help us to be obedient. Help us to listen to your words. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you today personally, that today is the day they come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ doesn't matter how hard we try. We can't do things because we're sinful creatures. But through Christ, we can do all things who strengthens us. Help us to be courageous men and women, to live godly lives. Maybe we've made a lot of mistakes in the past. It's not too late. All we've got to do is change directions today and give everything to you. And you will bless us and you will bless our families. What an awesome promise. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the blessings of children. And I pray, I thank you also that your word says that if I do train them up and I do righteous 
things that you will bless my children. So I do commit my life to wholeheartedly serving you, Father. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the love that we have and the relationships that we are constantly building through Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.